It's a beautiful spring day in Southern California. Summer. No, it's still spring. It's a spring day. It's the first day of spring almost. But it's a summer day. And it's a <laughs> summer day. <laughs> You're right. We're talking to Herb Vigran, who's had a great career uh, in front of the public. And uh, we're delighted that uh, we can spend some time to visit with you today. No, well, I'm delighted to be here on such a nice spring day. <laughs> it's a summer-like day. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now we're even. Herb, did your career start on Broadway? Well, to make the story, of course, as uh, short as possible, I'll begin with my birth. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, did my career start... Well... If you want to know when I first did my professional, first mm -hmm. professional, I joined Equity in 1934 out here. See, I graduated from Indiana University ah. from law school. I got my degree. I took the bar exam, and I hitchhiked to California to get in the movies. And when I got here, I had a letter saying that I had passed the bar, and it was a year later before I went back and became admitted. That was the end of my career. Did, but Did you did you uh, really want to become a lawyer? No, I never wanted to become a lawyer. Well, why did well you that's a long story. Well, tell you us. No. Well, you oh, know, I've got, a, lot, came, I got came, a stack of tape here. So when it came saying. time to go to college, my father, remember, this is the Depression. Yes. Uh -huh. When it came time to go to college, my folks said, uh, uh, well, what should we study, you know? Well, mm -hmm. I wanted to be a doctor, but blood made me faint. I wanted to be a chemist, but I couldn't add two and two. And so my father finally said, take law. It'll always stand you in good stead, no matter what you get into. Mm -hmm. Well, when I needed to sign a contract and, uh, for a radio show that I starred in, I hired a lawyer, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, uh, so actually, uh, after I had checked out here, I... Uh, hardly worked at all. I, I came here instead of New York because I had an aunt out here with whom I could live for free. Oh. And, uh, and um, uh, But I managed to land a part in Men in White at the then El Capitan Theater. It's now a movie house mm -hmm. on Hollywood Boulevard. And that was the beginning of my professional career. I joined Equity, cost 50 bucks, uh, friend of mine loaned me 25 and they deferred the other 25 <laughs> and uh, and that ran for quite a few weeks here and then it played in San Francisco and then of course the depression really set in and I started doing little well a, a friend of mine sent an agent around to see me in Men in White and he started getting me little jobs before the Screen Actors Guild mm -hmm. for $10 a day you know $15 a day and I did little things in movies, but uh, they were four or five, six months apart. You know, couldn't mm. live very well. Yeah, fifteen dollars a day was okay, but not two not, days a year. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyhow, I decided I better go back to New York. By this time, mm. I had a friend from Fort Wayne, which was my home, Indiana, who uh, who had an apartment now, and he was a cartoonist and doing very well. So he said I could come out and live with him. So wherever I found people I could live with for free, <laughs> I went. So anyhow, I went to New York. And uh, fortunately, the few little movies things that I had done, I uh, you, this isn't limited just to radio. No, uh, no, not at yeah. all. This the is few, limited to your career. The, uh, the few <laughs> little radio things, uh -huh. the few little uh, movie things that I had done, a day here, a day there, uh, I would manage to get a still. Like, for example, oh. if I had a couple of lines with Roz Russell in a mm -hmm. Columbia picture, somebody would shoot a picture of me and Roz Russell where I'm, I'm saying, uh, what have you got to say for the press, you know, <laughs> with the pencil and the paper. Yeah. And I had a whole bunch of stills. So when I went back to New York, I took that pile of stills, and they looked very impressive, and I mm -hmm. parlayed those into a Broadway career. Also, I did Vitaphone shorts. You remember those? Sure, I know you, that. You don't yeah. remember, but you may have heard about them. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So I did, and I started things looking up then. I was getting 35 a day. And uh, so uh, I stayed in New York and did quite a few shows and wound up doing, as I mentioned before we turned on the machine, uh, having a wonderful mm -hmm. time because you mentioned that you had uh, met with Sheldon Leonard. Yes. I and know. you also mentioned you're going to do Bacchus, who was married to to Hen Henrietta Henny Bacchus, who was also, it wasn't Bacchus then, 
She was also having a wonderful time on Broadway and ran for a whole year. That must have been a great s starting point for a lot of people, or a stepping off point at any well, rate. Well, you mean that particular show? Yes. Uh -huh. Oh, Cornell Wilde was in that show, uh, Sheldon, uh, Julie Garfield, uh, several others I can't think of uh, at the mm -hmm. moment. Jim Backus? No, Backus wasn't. I mean, uh, Henny Backus. Henny, Henny was and in And Vigrant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, who's that? Who's that? <laughs> yeah. So you stayed on Broadway for a while then? Uh, actually, that was near the end. Well, I, we opened in 37 and ran through 38. And then in February of 39, I had a long... Well, I'd done shows in between. Like, mm. uh, like I went on the road for George Abbott in Boy Meets Girl. And I'd worked for Walter Hampton. And I went on a tour with his final final farewell tour of Cyrano and um, Walter Hamden is the name most people won't know. Do you know the name? I Walter know the name. Hamden? Yeah. Well, you're a I'm scholar, an old guy, yeah. <laughs> a student of, of theater. Yeah. So, um, uh, but then, the, you know, the weights in between were just mm -hmm. murder and if you hadn't saved up much, which I did, I when I made 40 bucks a week and having a wonderful time, I put away 20. <laughs> Fortunately, I did because that's what I lived on later, mm -hmm. and and then it finally got to be so bad. I said, "Well, I'm going to take another crack at California, and if I don't make it, I'll go home and spend a miserable life as a lawyer in mm -hmm. Indiana." And I came out here, and did I you did find someone else, some another relative to live with when you came? No, out by second? now I'd I, I was getting nine dollars a week unemployment oh. from New York. <laughs> And I was practically living on that and the few bucks that I had left from those savings. And uh, I managed to pick up some radio shows, Lux and things like that. And one day I'm walking along Hollywood Boulevard and a guy that I'd been working on Lux with, just another radio actor, you know, who was as down and out as I was, said, hey, I just signed with a wonderful agent. He says, come on out there, I'll introduce you to her. Maybe she'll sign you up. This was Alan Ladd, and uh, he took me out to meet Sue Carroll. Oh, oh, uh -huh. who, and she signed me up, uh -huh. and she got me some pretty good jobs. And and and, but the the real break that I got was. Um, do you remember the late Gerald Moore? Yes, Jerry Moore. Mm -hmm. He later on starred in a, one of the early television shows, a, a spy thing. I I don't remember the name of it. But anyhow, I'd done some radio things with Jer, and, and he, he, he kind of took a liking to me and thought I had some kind of promise. And uh, so one day we were doing something. He says, I set up an appointment for you at uh, Young and Rubicam with, uh, with um, Glenn Hall Taylor's assistant. Now, Glenn Hall Taylor was direct. There were two prestige shows on Sunday. One was Gulf Screen Guild and the other was Silver Theater. Did they mm -hmm. ring any bells with sure. you? Sure. Oh, yes. Yeah, you're familiar Gulf with Gulf Screen Guild was the, uh, the the program where the actors would perform. The stars. Their fee, the stars yeah. would perform and then would fee would motion go to the home. motion picture home. Yeah, yeah. And the other one was called Silver Theater. It was uh, sponsored by International Silver. Mm -hmm. And this Glenn Hall Taylor was, I'm afraid to put my cord... No, that's better. Uh, it was sponsored. Uh, it was uh, produced and directed by Glenn Hall Taylor, and written. This particular one was written by True Boardman. So uh, Jerry Moore said, "I set up a, an appointment with you with uh, Ken Hansen, who was the assistant to Glenn Hall Taylor." He said, uh, "Over to Young and Rubicam at uh, ten o'clock, such and such a day in the morning." He says, "You go over there," and I told him about you. So. So I went over there at 10 o'clock, and I waited, and I waited, and at 10.30 he hadn't shown up, and I waited, and at 11 o'clock he hadn't shown up, <laughs> 11.30. Finally, it comes 12 o'clock, and I, he, I said, I don't care how, how broke I am or how much I <laughs> need to get a job, the hell with it, I'm not going to wait any longer. So I pressed the button on the elevator, and on that elevator that came up, Ken Hansen got off, apologizing profusely. His wife had had to be taken to the hospital in the middle of the night. He was unable to get to a telephone. He couldn't call me. He felt awful. He says, come on in. And uh, now it's after 12 o'clock, 
and I'd tell him a little about myself, and Jerry had told him, and he says, Glenn Hall's having an audition. He says, they've called everybody, but come on over. I'll sneak in the audition. So I went over there, and uh, they handed me a script, and the part they assigned to me said Western. And Jerry Moore was also auditioning for another part, and when he came out, after he had done his thing, he said, listen, he says, I don't care what it says in the script. He says, you go in there and play Herb Vigran. He says, don't pay any attention to what it says. Just play Herb. <clears throat> so I went in there, and I opened my mouth. They fell on the floor. <laughs> and that was the first time I knew that my voice was funny. I was trying to be an actor, before, you know, with the Shakespeare. So, but I never made it that way. But anyhow, so I got the, I, I, when there were three leading mm -hmm. parts. Uh, one of them that I did, one Jerry Moore did, and one Elliot Lewis did. I know you know who yes. Elliot mm -hmm. Lewis is. And a good friend of mine, Jerry Hausner, who, that might be a good guy for you, too. Jerry Hausner was the king of the baby cries. He used to do baby cries on all the live radio shows, on, you know, in front of an uh, audience. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then, oh, he, he, he was great. <laughs> and still is. Um Jerry said, who was a good friend of mine, he says, get a record made of this Silver Theater show. It was opposite Kay Francis, by the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I said, it's a record. It costs five bucks. Because <laughs> it seems like all I'm talking about is money now. That's all right. <laughs> money was probably very, very well, important Well, it was an important time. thing sure in those was. days, yeah. You needed it. <laughs> Anyhow. <coughs> so, um, uh, so I had a record mm -hmm. made. And I tucked that record under my arm and took it around and played it to all the radio producers. Mm -hmm. and, and from then on, everything was good, and it has been. It opened day. up for you then. Oh, you yeah. You heard your voice. And and then once you got a role, then yeah. the producer or the director well, knew who you yeah, were but, and but what they you listened could do. But they listened to this thing, and, yeah. you know, it was a good, uh, it was a good uh, demo. And then ultimately, I starred on radio... Now you wouldn't remember that because you weren't around. What, in the then. sad sack? Yeah. <laughs> sure, you were... Uh, Anyhow, I replaced... Uh -huh. uh, I was I was the summer replacement for Frank Sinatra for mm -hmm. Old Gold. And uh, unfortunately, it lasted only for the summer replacement, 13 weeks. And the Morris office had the package, and they were trying to sell it, but they finally came to the conclusion that people didn't want to listen to... didn't want to hear about the war anymore, you know. And everything about the war mm -hmm. was... So that was the end of that. But it wasn't uh, the sad sack uh, really kind of returning from the service at that. Oh yeah, only only veteran, only veterans were connected with the with, with the show uh -huh. at all. Yeah. Oh yes, the the opening show was where he, he says, oh, "Hello, I'm back." Well, I am. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, he was he was coming back, and he's looking for his old girlfriend, uh -huh. and his uniform was ill fitting, and and Bacchus who played his. Good friend, I forget the name, uh, had taken all his clothes. <laughs> <laughs> during during the war uh, on Armed Forces Radio, Mel Blank played a uh, a continuing character on a number of the uh, AFRS shows called The Sad Sack. Really? He, he did a uh, kind of a almost a stuttering kind of a character, porky almost pig. a Porky Pig type. Yeah. But. Uh, but it didn't have any relation. Uh, no, to this it wasn't the this sad. Yeah. This was the sad sack. Yeah. This was written by George Baker. Mm -hmm. uh, well, actually, the scripts were not written yeah. by George Baker. It was based on but the but sad sack. But it was, sack it was uh, George. I got a couple of autographed copies of his sad mm -hmm. sack books. Uh, I mean, it was with you know he he was paid for the for the use of that. Of course, Jerry Lewis later did a, a, a movie. At least one movie, yeah, maybe more, uh, based on the sad mm -hmm. call, the sad mm -hmm. sack, mm -hmm. yeah. In your radio days, you you were very very busy, uh, working this show and that running. show, and uh, we were always running. Running. Mm -hmm. How many shows were you doing at one time, or could you have done at one time, or did you? Do I did <laughs> three shows in one and a half hour one time. Three shows <laughs> in a half an hour. It was the beginning of tape. Uh, it was oh. the very beginning of tape. So one of the sh shows was on tape. But one of them, we used to run between the studios, mm -hmm. and, you know. One of them, I forget what they were even, but but I know that, that I did that. One of them, I was in the first five minutes. And the other one, I was in the last five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one was taped. So, <laughs> so there were two live shows and one tape yeah. show all playing at the same yeah. Listeners uh, couldn't get away from you. That, yeah. uh, that part's yeah. a good thing. <coughs> did you have a, a, a role that uh, did some... Uh, Repeated sometimes on the Fibber McGee and Molly. 
Uh, yeah. Well, we were talking about it when, when I met you mm -hmm. the other day with Phil Leslie. Uh, it was the only thing that I ever dreamed up myself that I presented to anybody that said, hey, how about this? And they, 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 they included it only for like four or five times because it was terribly difficult to write. Mm -hmm. I, it was Herbert Tappel. Uh, oh, Herbert Tappel? No, not, not, not Tappel. Apple, Apple. Herbert Tappel. It was he stuck the last syllable of the preceding word onto the vowel of the next <laughs> word. And there were some funny jokes that they had, but they said it was funny. said it was too difficult. But I did a lot of the Fibber shows, as I did a lot mm -hmm. of the Bennies. And, and, and then I was kind of uh, more or less a, a fixture, not with, under a contract or anything, on Durante Moore. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, Fibber and Benny and Hope and... Yeah, and Eddie Cantor. Yes, you did a lot of work with Eddie Cantor. Yeah, didn't you? yeah. There were so well. They knew when they had a good, solid comedian, and mostly you were playing comedy things, comedy things. On, on 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 the comedy shows, obviously. Yeah. But Lux, for example. Now you said you did a, a lot of Lux radio theater programs. Now, when you would do one of those shows, and Screen Guild yeah. did, did those things. What kind of preparation did you have to have? For those roles, or how did they? How did they call? They just call your agent, or they call you, and you get the part. And they I don't give you think the we had agents in those days. They, they just mm -hmm. you, you, they just called you. They didn't have casting people either mm -hmm. in those days. The, the director said, "Oh, Virginia Gregg can play this." There's one guy kept saying, "I got I got a terrible illness. It's called Gregitis. He <laughs> couldn't every show that he cast. He he." he Used, but he tried to use other people. He wound up using. He couldn't stand it. He had to have Virginia Gregg on the show. Uh -huh. Well, she's wonderful, you know. Let's face it. Uh, so no, they would just call us preparation. Uh, just the rehearsals, you know. Some of the rehearsals were. I'll tell you a horror story, and it'll give you. It'll answer your question to a degree mm -hmm. about Lux. Well, Lux was the most rehearsed show probably of all of them. And I don't remember the exact times or dates, but Lee would like, for example, we'd get to have a meeting on, Lux was on Monday, like maybe on Wednesday we'd get together and read. Mm -hmm. And then maybe on Thursday we'd read and put it on the mic and go over it. And on Sunday, for I'm not sure of these yes, times, uh -huh. something like that, on Sunday we'd get together and rehearse and have our breaks and take direction from the director and then we do a dress rehearsal with an audience it's what is now the Huntington Hartford mm -hmm. Theater uh, we do a dress rehearsal with an audience then Monday the day of the show we'd rehearse a lot more and again do a live dress rehearsal with an audience and then we do the show at, I think it's seven o'clock at night by now we this was the third time we're in front of an mm -hmm. audience right mm -hmm. So every Christmas, they would do uh, a miracle on 34th Street with mm -hmm. Edmund Gwen, and uh, a lot of us were always play the same parts that we'd played the year before. And I played the guy that, when the judge says bring in those letters to Santa Claus, and I played the guy who was on the mail truck. I said, but your honor, they're what I was trying to tell him is they're bags and bags and bags. Mm -hmm. Anybody wouldn't listen to him. He says, bring them in, bring them in. So okay, through rain, sleet, what the we <laughs> deliver. So I had that little and that episode, and then I had another appearance, and then another appearance later, same character in the mm -hmm. show. Well, the night of the show of this particular year. Um, I now this was at Huntington Hartford Theater. You know where CBS Radio is over on Gower, mm -hmm. yes, in Sunset. Mm -hmm. So it's just a few blocks you, you run between, you know. So I had at eight o'clock was beginning the what they used to call an audition record. Today they call them pilots mm -hmm. of Father Knows Best, the very first mm -hmm. Father Knows Best with Bob Young. Yeah. So I had a was cast to play a part in that. What, what was his name? It was uh, I later appeared in it quite a bit as as as, as Bob Young's sidekick and friend. Can't remember <laughs> the character's name. Anyhow, so I had to be there at eight o'clock 
for the start of the show. And Lux didn't get off the air until 8 o'clock. So I went to Fred Mackay, a lovely man who was a director who's not with us anymore. And I said, oh, on Lux, there was a lot of ad-libbing went on. And the ad-libbing was, 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 was orchestrated. There was, everybody who wasn't on the mic would stand off to one side and another mic, and a, sort of an ad-lib leader would take a cue from Fred Mackay for the bring up the ad libs like at a party scene yeah, and bring them noises, down. Yeah. And all the actors that weren't on camera, on on mic, were over here on this other doing the ad libs. And you were required to do that. And nobody ever objected to it. And so I asked Fred Mackay, I said, I have to be over for this father knows best thing. Uh, I said, is it all right with you? If when I finish my final scene, instead of hanging around for the ad libs, is it all right if I take off and go over to CBS? And uh, and uh, he said, sure, you know, go ahead. Well, we had done a dress rehearsal, as I pointed out, with an audience on Sunday. We had done a dress rehearsal on Monday with an audience, and now we're doing the show. And I did my first section, and I did my second section. And I took off, and I still had one little little <laughs> section of a few lines to do. I didn't. I was. I wasn't aware of it. I, in my head, I had finished, mm -hmm. and I, he said I could go, so I went. I went over. We did Fathers and Best. It was a big success. So they bought the show. Went on for a long time. But the following Wednesday, <laughs> um, over at KHJ, was sitting there marking a script for a show called California Caravan. And Willie Waterman was in it. And Willie Waterman comes in and starts marking. He says, what happened to you Monday? I, I said, what do you mean? He says, Monday on Lux. I said, well, what happened? I said, what are you talking about? He says, Monday, when you, when you left. You know. I said, what? He says, don't you know? I said, no, what? <laughs> he says, you, you, you left. You weren't finished. You <laughs> oh, boy, did I get sick. I couldn't believe it. I was you know, literally sick, you know. And I said, well, this is the end of me. I'll never work again <laughs> in my whole life. Uh, so as soon as I finished California Caravan, I quick ran over to the Lux office. Fred McKay wasn't there. And I said to the secretary, I said, is it true? She said, yeah. I said, oh, my God. So, um, so I finally got a hold of Fred Mackay, and he was very sweet. And he says, "Don't worry about it." He said, "Gil Stratton." When everybody looked around, and there was this big pause, Gil Stratton looked around. He didn't see me. Walked up to the mic, read my lines, and Fred Mackay said, "Nobody in New York ever knew. <laughs> they never knew." And but boy, I, I didn't sleep for several nights. And Fred McKay called me to do the show the following oh, week. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that would really yeah. get you scared. So that it? answers your show. Yeah. What kind of, your question, what kind of preparation do you do? <laughs> Too and, much. <laughs> and it's also one of my worst horror stories. Oh, boy. We're talking with Herb yeah. Vigran, who has some great memories, and we're going to continue with them in just a moment. We're talking with Herb Vigran, who has some memories of uh, the Lux Radio Theater and uh, his role in the as Sad Sack, a starring role. What other things did you do in radio? Let, let me give you, before, before I say that, let, let, let me give you one little footnote to the story I just told you. On Lux. Uh, on Lux, yeah. Uh, when they realized what had happened after the show was over, Eddie Marr said, my God, I bet you he's laying out in the street somewhere with a heart attack. <laughs> Fortunately, I never knew it until the following Wednesday. <laughs> well, did anybody know why, the other cast member, did they know why you were... Why you were oh, I don't think it leave? mattered whether they knew or not. Oh, we, we were uh, all doing. We, all of us did those sort of things. Yeah. Oh, you know. so if you ducked out, uh, it wouldn't make oh, any difference. Oh no, they knew I was going off to another show yeah. somewhere oh. because uh, they all did the same thing. Well, you Gil know. Stratton was the guy who saved the day. Yeah, Gil know. saved the day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And did you buy him a, 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 you know, an Irish whiskey or something Fine, after this? Time I did. You bet. <laughs> 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 We've talked about it many times. <laughs> yeah. Now, what what other shows you said? Well, did you have any other? Uh, We've talked a lot about different radio things that you've done. What Running other? parts, mm -hmm. not really. In Gunsmoke, the uh, the TV Gunsmoke, mm -hmm. 
I played a character called Judge Brooker that was recurring. Mm-hmm. In, uh, in, um, I thought of another one just now. No, no, it is. Well, we talk, let's talk about TV. You made a, a pretty easy transition. Oh. Uh, oh, yeah, well, I'll tell you that in a minute. Okay. I remember the other thing yeah. that, I, that I had a running part in, and it was uh, short lived. It was uh, Edwin. It was called The Edwin Show, and it was the final thing he did after he blossomed out into a, into a straight actor, mm-hmm. you know, after Keenan get, talked him into doing that. Requiem for a Heavy yes. Man, whatever it was. Anyhow, this was the Edwin show, and he played a grandfather, and and uh, I played his uh, attorney and confidant, Ernie the attorney. But it was a mm-hmm. kid show, and it was sponsored by Chesterfield cigarettes, which wasn't the a finest kid? kind of a combination. A kid show? Yeah, and that. You mean it really was a kid show? Or was well, it I mean, no, it was family oriented show. Oh. oh no, 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 it wasn't a kid show. Oh. No, it was family oriented. Mm-hmm. It was a nice family. You know, he was a friendly grandfather, and like I say, I was his friend, and uh, and it just the sponsor dropped it, realizing this is no way to sell cigarettes, and nobody else picked it up, and that was the end of it. Ernie, the attorney. So your legal uh, training. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. Of, uh, Help, helped a lot. <laughs> Yeah, the Stanislavski method. Yeah. You just went right yeah. in. <laughs> yeah. Now what was it? Television. You moved easily from radio oh, to television. Oh, the transition. Mm-hmm. Well, I was very lucky. You see, mm-hmm. most of us, many of us, who had done all that radio in the early days of television, all of the producers and directors and writers of, of early TV were the uh, radio writers and producers mm-hmm. and directors. So I went right into. I Love Lucy, Jess Oppenheimer was was the producer, Madeline uh, Martin and, and Bob Carroll were the mm-hmm. writers. They had written uh, My Favorite Husband, which was a show that Lucy had done. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and uh, the Eve Arden show, the same guy who was directing that, who was directed an Eve Arden yeah, show on, on you know. TV. So all of those things. And so, uh, yes, I made a very fortunate uh, transition. I was one of the busiest guys in the early television days. Well, didn't you play a bad guy on uh, Superman? Oh, even? I sure did. That's <laughs> that's my most... That's what I'm known for. All the three generations of, of, of guy, people now know me for that. The ones who grew up at that time, mm-hmm. their kids, and now, now their um, grands. Gr- it, it never stops running, you know. It never stops running. Did the checks right? keep po- coming oh, in? Oh, no. Come on. <laughs> They don't, huh? Zilch, nothing, zero. That and was it's one of the big thorns in my side and a lot of other people's sides. And I'm not going to tell you who's responsible for who was president of the Screen Actors Guild and sold us down the river on a, when we were on strike for residuals. Uh, I won't mention it. That, is he president of any large organization uh, nowadays? He's always been a president of something. <laughs> <you know. laughs> Herb, when did when did that change though? When did it change when when you as an actor in a television series uh, started to share in the residuals as they Well, were this along? incident that I'm talking mm-hmm. about, we were on strike for residuals. Period. Because, mm-hmm. well, this is when it finally being put it was finally on film and, mm-hmm. and not being a kinescope, so that it could be repeated and repeated uh, and uh-huh. repeated. The kinnies were lousy. I don't know mm-hmm. if you remember. Sure. You must yeah, have seen, they, they, they yeah. yeah. Anyhow. And we wound up with a contract. I'm really not going to go into it because I could. <laughs> it makes me terribly unhappy. I don't want you to be unhappy. And uh, influences my voting in this coming election. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, we got residuals mm-hmm. for the first five reruns. After that, they owned it in perpetuity. We got nothing. Mm-hmm. So those early shows, Superman. I suppose I got paid for the first five. I don't mm-hmm. even remember. But big amounts, like when it got down towards the, the last uh, few payments, like $8.29 or three sixty, you know, $3.60. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And, and I still get a, a residual once in a while for $4.13. And this, this went on with all those early shows. I got mm-hmm. so many of those early ones that... They're just running them like crazy. I well, love Lucy. You know, oh, yeah. But ultimately, and I can't tell you when, and just within relatively the last decade, I would say, you see, 
every time there was a negotiation with the Screen Actors Guild and the, and the other side, mm -hmm. everything was based on that initial contract. So traditionally, if labor got a raise in those days, what, what did labor get? 3%, 4% mm -hmm. raise, right? So when we go in, well, I'll give you an example. The first radio commercial I did, I got $17 for, here we are talking money again. I got $17 mm -hmm. for 13 weeks unlimited use. 17 bucks. Now, when AFTRA goes in, wants to negotiate a new deal, and they wanted to double it, they wanted to get 35 which is nothing for 13 weeks mm -hmm. unlimited. Yes. Yeah. They said, you want a 100% raise? You're crazy. You know, who? nobody gets. So unfortunately, all the old... All the, the, the subsequent negotiations were based on the initial, mm -hmm. see? Mm -hmm. In other words, the basis was so horrible that no matter how big a, a, a thing you negotiate, it was amounted to nothing until, as I say somewhere, I believe just in the last decade, I don't, don't hold me in the numbers or times, but ultimately it got to the point where the first rerun you, in television, you would get 100% uh, oh, those those initial uh, uh, residuals were based on scale. No matter mm -hmm. how much you got, no matter what your actual salary was, they were based on scale. So that's scale. why they were mm -hmm. so minuscule. But now, f ultimately, as I said, ultimately the residuals were based on your actual salary. So if you made a fairly decent four-figure amount mm -hmm. for doing a television show, the first rerun at least, you got the same thing over again. Well, now that wasn't bad, but by this time I was an old face and wasn't working that much. <laughs> well, I'm not complaining. But uh, <laughs> if, if you so so if you were to appear in a TV show this week, mm -hmm. uh, then when they reran it over the summer, you get the same salary for this it's that a, first run. It's a very involved, mm -hmm. complex kind of a formula. If it's rerun in prime time. You get your full salary. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know. But I'm really not that that thoroughly versed with it, um, or versed in it. You'd have to talk to SAG or, or somebody. Well, I'll just knows. just yeah. But but at least it's it's fairly substantial. Yeah, yeah. Even after it gets down to the fourth or fifth or sixth run. Today yeah. I get, you know, sometimes a, a, a ninth run on uh, Charlie's Angels or yes, something uh -huh. like that. And it's a, at least a, a hundred or two or three. You mm -hmm. know, it's it's not twenty nine cents. So they run. So no matter how many runs now, you might you might get some pay. Oh, and now it's in perpetuity. Right. They don't ever cut yeah. you off now. Oh, that yeah. yeah. But see, I would think. I know everybody, w and we're really not here to discuss the the union arrangements yeah. and all that. But, but I I would imagine in in the beginning, nobody dreamed that there would be a market. Well, that, that's after a couple that's, of times. That's one you know. of the things. That's one yeah. of the arguments that this fellow used. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, uh, "He said, how many times are you going to run this thing? You yeah. know, people aren't going to keep watching it. Yeah. You know." But now, with all but the cable dreamed? channels and all of this sort of thing, but who over dreamed that Superman would become a cult? <laughs> yeah. That true. I Love Lucy would will 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 never yeah. stop running because they're they're they're. There was some chemistry there that that hardly ever happens. You know, I don't know that it's ever happened again. Well, what it is is it it, it becomes a program like that. I think becomes a part of your your life. Your life. You see. Yes, but aside from that, I mean, the, the Isle of Lucy life, shows you know? were were comedy classics, yes. yeah. and it was something to do with the writing and and Lucy mm -hmm. and Desi. Yeah. Sure. You know. And uh, they they were just they're fabulous to look at today, you know. Where you look at some old I Love Beavers or, or Leave It to Beavers, yeah. which are great and they're still running and they're fine. But I mean, they don't have the the, the mm -hmm. real because people are nuts today about I Love Lucy and the Superman. My God, they go crazy. They go around the people, campuses with they, them and the they stop me all the time, mm -hmm. you know. It's just, it's, and well, I that's it. Now, see, that's that's California living for you. You made yeah. these things in the early '50s, and you're walking down the street now. Yeah. They stop you and they recognize you. Yeah. You haven't gotten uh, even you know, though I've changed a little bit. <laughs> <No. Yeah. laughs> Herb, yeah. did you ever work for Jack Webb? 
Oh, yes, I did a lot an of those. An awful lot, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, an awful lot, yeah. Many many of the dragnet uh, things. Well, you see a lot of the, uh, and most of his people were radio people. Mm -hmm. Now, he was Virginia Gregg all the time. Yes. And, uh, oh, I can't think of his name. Anyhow, but Olin was in it. Art Gilmore was mm -hmm. in it. Was he a, an easy guy to work for? Well, uh, a lot of people didn't think so. I loved him. I, mm -hmm. I had never had a problem with Jack. I got along just great with Jack. But he, 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 was, he was a very positive guy and a very impatient guy. And then he put up with no nonsense. But boy, he knew what he wanted, and he got what he mm -hmm. wanted. And like I say, I never had a problem with him. Uh, like some directors would pick, pick a whipping boy, you know. But you know, Jack never did that, to my knowledge. He was an awful nice guy, really. Uh, we miss him. You've worked an awful lot over the years in radio and television, and occasionally on the stage. Have you have you done more work on the stage in in relatively recent years? Have you done anything like well, that? Well, want to do after like I that? came back out after radio started getting mm -hmm. real good. Uh, I did a few things. I did. I went to uh, Phoenix to the Sombrero theater there and did uh, Little Success Spoil Rock Hunter with Wally Cox, the late Wally Cox. And then I did, they had bought, Paramount had bought Detective Story for Kirk Douglas. And Kirk wanted to do it, wanted to do the play. So they did the play in Phoenix and I played Monaghan who was the I, for, I don't know who's playing it downtown. It's playing right now at the Islandson. Charlton Heston is playing. Yeah, it. I know. Well, it was lead, the part yeah. opposite. It was yeah. the part opposite. It was the male, second male character in the mm -hmm. show that I played. His boss. Mm -hmm. And I played that part. And um, but it didn't get me in the picture. <laughs> got <laughs> got Kirk Douglas in the picture. After those bits. Speaking of the pictures, after the 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 bits that you did. Uh, where well you had the stills and you brought them to the, the east. Yeah. You came back. Then you did some other work in movies. As oh, well. then you, you oh yeah. Well, then it was a little different. Yeah. yeah. Then I did uh, like White Christmas, mm -hmm. which runs all the time, and quite a few movies. The most recent movie I did was uh, 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 the First Lady Supreme Court Justice, uh, first Monday in October, oh, uh -huh. with uh, Matthau and uh, Joel Claver. So you are an active, working actor today. Uh, in not as places. nearly as active as I used to be because my age, there aren't that, those kind of parts. And there's mm -hmm. great competition for parts my age, you know. Uh, I, go on a, I go on a lot of commercial auditions. Mm -hmm. And when I go on the commercial auditions, you, there's a whole room full of me's sitting there, <laughs> you know, a whole room full. Uh -huh. And they audition and call you back and put you on camera and send it to New York. And all you got to do is sit in the middle of that room and close your eyes and point a finger, and anybody in the whole room can do it. But they all like the trip out here. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, you know about that. I know about the trip. <laughs> well, it's all work for us. We just come out here. Yeah. Just, just <laughs> yeah. Uh, have you been on any uh, commercials that we might? Uh, I just did the. Think about? I just did one that should be coming out shortly. Uh, You've seen those Charlie Chaplin things for IBM? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I just did one of those. Oh, good. Yeah, uh, they're all silent and they're mm -hmm. all sped up. But I play a guy who presents him with an award because his branch of the factory uh, was the most productive. Mm -hmm. And so I present <laughs> him with this award. It's nothing much, but uh, I hope it runs a lot. It yeah, sure. <laughs> hasn't started yet, to my knowledge. If you had your choice right now of any... Any role or any any job within the, this industry or with outside of it, I suppose. What would you like to do most right now, at this time, this stage of, of your career? I don't know. Just keep a little busy doing this thing and that. The guy I have no big big yen at my age now to. to uh, uh, I don't even know if I'd want to do a series if it finally came along. Because series could be a lot of work, couldn't it? Hard work, hard work, and hard, bad hours, you know. Mm -hmm. So with my lifestyle now, which is kind of pleasant. <laughs> well, that's uh, the nice. The kids are grown that's and good. gone, you know. 
So you can keep your hand in it? You can do a Yeah, like a well, I, I do one occasionally. Yeah. You know, I do a show here and I do a show there. And, but like I say, it's not nearly like mm-hmm. it used to be. But I guess that's a... I don't know. I have no great desire. I just... It, I, it's nice to it's nice to keep busy. It's nice to get on the mm-hmm. set. It's nice to to exercise a little bit. Mm-hmm. But uh, I got no big, you know. I wouldn't want to become like Marie Dressler did, uh, become a star in her do- dotage, <laughs> my dotage. I know what you'd like to do though. If there was a another uh, Sears Radio Theater or another CBS Mystery Playhouse or something. Uh, uh, where we'd get a, another hour or two of uh, creative radio uh, those were every fun. week. You know about you could, the series. Oh, thing. sure. You, oh, could, you worked were... for Elliot on that, didn't sure. you, Elliot Lewis? And uh, there you can pop into a sound stage for uh, a morning and uh, oh, yeah. do a run-through and lay it down oh. on tape. And uh, yeah, There's no money in it, but uh, but it was oh, it's a whole home week, you know. Yeah. <laughs> That's, it's fun. You know, you do that for nothing. Yeah. <clears> Hunt <throat> the late, wonderful... Hans Conry used to get down on his knees and, and say, "Just give me a radio show. I'll do it for nothing." Yeah, yeah. yeah they, those were great, great, great days. The camaraderie that we had mm-hmm. when we'd sit around a table for the first reading—just wonderful. You know, half an hour before anybody reads a line of the script, just kibitzing. You, you go on and walk on a motion picture set. That doesn't happen mm-hmm. anymore. And it was great. And we had a great bunch of people, and those were wonderful years. Well, you contributed a lot to those wonderful years well, for the the people on the other side of the uh, the radio, listening well, out there. Well, it always that. seems strange to, for me to contemplate that. But because uh, to me, it was, <laughs> it was something to do every day, you know. Yeah, was but it was, it, was, it was a yeah. job, perhaps, that uh, brought you... Recognition, yeah. uh, much much more perhaps than if you were on a bench, you know, pounding the gavel as a oh, judge or oh, that would be hard. Uh, pleading, a, pleading a case in a courtroom someplace. Yeah. We're glad you decided to go in the show business. We thank you for all the work you did on radio and in the TV and the movies. You did a wonderful job entertaining all of us and speaking for all of all of us. I thank you, Herb Vigran. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks very much.